it's absolutely wonderful that you all worked against the death penalty and that Virginia has finally at long last done away with the thing. Um, I, if we could just get the United States to do away with the death penalty as its chief means of international relations, we would be, we would be well on the way. Um, I, I, and it's great that you are going to be meeting with Bill and, and Maria. Um, I, I may mention them uh, as I'm sharing my uh, PowerPoint because they are hard at work uh, trying to prevent uh, the expansion of draft registration to include young women as well as young men, uh, this being the big democratic, large D democratic, uh, progressive feminist right to be forced against your will to kill and die for Lockheed Martin. Um, and uh, when we, so, so I was told I should speak for a while and then do questions and answers. So I'll do that. And when we get to questions and answers, you can explain to me why the draft is, a, is an anti-war tool and so forth. Um, I, I do live up here in, in Charlottesville. I'm going to be down in Lynchburg this weekend to get uh, vaccinated. Uh, apparently, somebody shipped a bunch of vaccines to Lynchburg thinking that people who lived there would want them, uh, which apparently was not the case. So uh, <laughs> if anybody else hasn't gotten vaccinated, that's the place to go. Um, but, I'm, but I'm not that far from Roanoke and have enjoyed being there with you all in the past, um, where I'm just one one misrepresentative in Congress district over. Um, let me see if I can share screen. And let me know. Let me know if you're seeing a big green screen now. Yes. Okay. Um, so far, I haven't had any problems with you know people needing to mute or anything. But if you're, if something gets very loud where you are, feel free to mute and unmute again. Um, so I, I'm going to talk a little bit here uh, about the state uh, at the moment of wars and militarism, and then uh, a good bit about things that we can do and and be doing and. Uh, uh, some of this may be familiar to many of you. Uh, much of it should be should be pretty new. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about things we can do, both in terms of activism and in terms of education. Um, it, and if there are too many words on some of these PowerPoint screens, uh, and you actually care what they say, I'll, I'll be glad to send you all the link to the to the PowerPoint and the PDF uh, afterwards. But uh, we have a, we have a resource at World Beyond War called the Peace Almanac, which we sell as a book and put online for free, and have as a radio, you know, two minute blurbs every day that radio stations can take and use, and it's at peacealmanac.org. Uh, and <clears throat> today is the anniversary of the first uh, freedom rides, uh, which were be long before the famous 1960-61 freedom rides. Uh, and which came out of the, the organizing by the conscientious objectors to World War II in US prisons who organized to integrate prisons and came out and organized to integrate uh, the outside world. Um, we had today, as some of you may have seen, an announcement from uh, President Joe Biden that, in fact, Donald Trump, in all of his genius, uh, got military spending, which he wildly and dramatically increased, just about exactly right. Almost enough. Needed to be just a little bit more. Uh, and he would have had it just right. Uh, and so we have this proposal, despite the, you know, the ever greater environmental catastrophe that needs addressing, uh, the ever greater risk of nuclear apocalypse, deadly disease pandemics uh, raging. Uh, we have this proposal from Joe Biden to go ahead. Oh, I see. I get to... Uh, I get to let people in the waiting room. There we go. Um, we have this proposal to go ahead and, and keep spending Trump level spending on the US military, uh, which is just incredible, while proposing big spending on other things, better things than the military, uh, to be paid for with very small taxes on corporations that will pay for the next spending bill over the next 15 years. 
you know, as if as if the need to pay for anything else is not going to come up between now and and 2036. Um, and, and the military spending level in the United States, uh, mm-hmm. as you may be aware, but most people in the United States are not, uh, is nothing like anywhere else in the world. Uh, is darn near the rest of the world's military spending put together, um, and we have. We have Congress members talking about how they'd like to reduce military spending, sending letters to the president, tweeting nice tweets, but not a single one of them yet, uh, even, you know, pretending to make a commitment to vote no on on bills that fund military spending at the current level. Um, I say pretending not to insult them, but, but because that's their record. Uh, if Congress members, you know, over the past decades that we've been doing this, you know, we've had times when we had 100 Congress members swearing they would vote against funding the war on Iraq. And then, you know, 85 to 90 of them doing so anyway. So um, there we go. Um, so obviously what we need uh, is to move the money from militarism to human needs, environmental needs, green energy, uh, infrastructure. There's actually a a bill, uh, Senator Markey and Congressman Khanna have a bill called the ICBM Act uh, that would move money from ICBMs, from missiles to vaccines. Uh, This is the kind of of legislation we need uh, at this point. We also have numerous ongoing wars, uh, including the war on Yemen, which is at the moment and has been for years now the deadliest uh, with deaths caused by violence and starvation and disease. And we actually have a Congress that voted twice bipartisanly in both houses uh, in the previous Congress under the previous president when they could count on a veto to end US participation in the war on Yemen. Uh, We have just now Congressman Ro Khanna finally mentioning the possibility of Congress waking up uh, and acting after months uh, to end the war on Yemen, uh, but not having done so. Um, So this is, you know, this is a top demand. um, And uh, most of these demands that, that I mentioned, you'll see a link on the screen. Uh, you can also go to worldbeyondwar.org or rootsaction.org. These are a couple of places I work uh, to find ways to email Congress members, phone Congress members, sign petitions, uh, learn more, etc. cetera. Um, but we, uh, we have not had this Congress lift a finger yet, uh, not a single one of them, to, to end a single one of the endless wars that they promised to end, that Biden promised to end, that the Democratic Party platform promised to end, uh, or even uh, in response to missile strikes with press releases accompanying them, uh, which, you know, we did have war powers resolutions introduced following similar uh, missile attacks by Trump. Um, Another one of the wars yet to be ended is Afghanistan, uh, another broken promise. Uh, One strategy uh, that uh, some of us have been promoting uh, is to get some of the other governments uh, around the world. There are 35 countries now uh, with troops still in Afghanistan uh, and six that have taken them out. Uh, And I think the more we can praise those six and demand uh, action out of the others, the more we can bring pressure on the U.S. government, uh, to which, which of course has more troops and is the, the ringleader here, to get its troops out of Afghanistan. Uh, there is, of course, the possibility of a congressional strategy uh, of getting the Congress to end the war on Yemen and then move on to ending the war on Afghanistan. Uh, but this is, you know, a strategy of months or years at the pace that that Congress seems inclined to do things. Uh, and then there is the, the Biden strategy uh, to, to pressure the, the White House, which is even less under our influence than, uh, than the Congress, uh, to finish up its, its negotiations uh, and get out. Another one of the ongoing wars, very 
you know, very little talked about, even in comparison to the teeny bit in which uh, to which some of these other wars are talked about, uh, is Syria, where the United States has troops it's backing and arming and supporting that have a chunk of territory that are controlling oil that uh, are, are helping to impoverish Syria, uh, which is uh, suffering under sanctions as Iran, Cuba, so many other countries. Uh, and the United States continues with its goal of overthrowing the government of Syria. Um, the, the goal of addressing ISIS having been a, a distraction and never a central uh, goal of the US government, uh, although it certainly was of the US public. Um, and, and, and of course, the bombings, uh, you know, have been going on through the Trump years and the Biden years, uh, including before and since uh, that one uh, missile strike that came with a press release. In Virginia, we've got this guy named Tim Kaine as a senator uh, who is constantly talking about war powers and the need for Congress to authorize the wars and how illegal it is for Donald Trump to send missiles into Syria without Congress. Uh, and here's a, a screenshot of a video on my YouTube page of me asking him at, at UVA uh, a couple of years back, uh, how in the world could Congress possibly make legal murdering people with missiles in Syria and him admitting that it couldn't and then going straight back into his old, uh, you know, rhetoric that he uses to this day of the need for Congress to authorize uh, the wars, uh, you know. So rather than ending all of the wars, what you're getting from the more anti-war so-called Congress members at this point is talk about replacing the AUMFs, the authorizations for the use of military force, with a new one, <laughs> not a not not simply repealing them, but, but creating a new one. And, and from Senator Kane, first I want to find out the thou shalt's and the thou shalt nots from the White House, uh, it, which is apparently uh, you know, a god as well as a, an executor of, of what the Congress is supposed to control. Um, so this is, you know, this is an ongoing problem. Uh, Another area of crisis uh, is, of course, Iran, where we had the promise from the Biden campaign, from the Democratic Party, that the, the reinstitution of the, the rejoining of the Iran nuclear agreement uh, that President Obama had put in place, uh, and everyone having known for many months prior to the election and inauguration of Joe Biden that there would be a limited number of months uh, in which to do this, uh, and that it would only happen if the United States undid at least some of its sanctions, uh, and that coming in and demanding changes from Iran uh, after having, after Iran complied with the agreement and the United States did not, and the United States left it, uh, was not going to work. And come June, Iran would be sure to elect a government that would want nothing to do with any negotiations with anybody. Uh, and that certainly looks like uh, where we're headed if something doesn't change soon. Uh, there are talks underway uh, and we'll see where they go, but we need to keep up the pressure on this. Uh, it's very hard to believe that, uh, that this is not, you know, an intentional so-called failure. The International Criminal Court, uh, we finally, finally last week uh, had President Biden lift the sanctions that Trump had imposed on the top prosecutors and officials at the International Criminal Court. Uh, it, it's hard to imagine anything more lawless, you know, as you're, as you're pushing these massive military budgets in, in the name of the rule of law and the rule-based order of the, of the globe and so forth. Anything more lawless than sanctioning uh, the International Criminal Court. Uh, and of course, when they lifted the sanctions, um, 
U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, put out a statement making very clear that we still oppose the International Criminal Court. We discourage anyone from working with them, but we're for rules and law and cooperation, uh, you know, so. We also have uh, a problem in the United States of increased sentiment and rhetoric uh, against countries, including Russia and China, Russia being the country that together with the United States uh, has about 90% of the nuclear weapons on earth. Uh, and of course, there's some partisan bias. People who identify with the Democratic Party are more likely to blame Russia for everything and the Republican more likely to blame China for everything. But this works out very well for the US government, which is happy to blame both of them for everything. Uh, and so we put out a statement uh, last week or the week before uh, encouraging President Biden not to call the president of Russia a killer or say he has no soul and so forth, even though obviously he's a killer and nobody has a soul, but, uh, but to not recklessly insult foreign leaders, particularly those of governments uh, <laughs> with enough nuclear weapons to destroy the planet many times. Uh, and we got no comment back from the White House, but we did uh, see extensive government coverage in the Russian media and statement by uh, the Russian foreign minister in response. So we know that they know and care that there are people in the United States who want to negotiate peacefully uh, rather than throw accusations and name calling. Um, Another, another point of increasing uh, danger is Ukraine with the United States talking about more ships into the Black Sea and more weapons and the Ukrainian government uh, talking about war and talking about uh, conquering Crimea and, and so forth. Um, and, and you have this problem of people in the United States imagining that Donald Trump was anti-NATO and anti-Ukraine and anti-proper Cold War hostility toward Russia. And therefore, if, if you're not supportive of, uh, of belligerence toward Russia, well, you're a racist and uh, you're a, a, a Trump fanatic. And it's, it's very strange and nonsensical, but this is you know, part of what we're up against at this point. Um, so this was the this was the genius of of Russia Gate, right? You take someone like Trump, who very similar to his predecessor and his successor, uh, is you know taking all sorts of steps that are hostile toward Russia, uh, weapons to Ukraine, blocking Russian energy deals, uh, forcing NATO members to buy more weapons continuing the militarization of the border of Russia, putting missiles on the border of Russia, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you have actual, honest to God, living human beings in the United States, intelligent, kind, decent people who believe that Trump works for <laughs> the leader of the government he's so hostile toward. It's, it's very, very strange, but this is part of what we're up against. Um, and, and so we now have you know, a new brand, a new party, a new president. Uh, a war is now not going to be racist and fascist. It's going to be humanitarian and anti-terrorism and anti-Trump. Uh, but there's not much difference uh, if you're living in one of the wars. Um, so this is a little uh, cartoon of Senator uh, Cinema from from Arizona who did a little happy dance when she voted no on the minimum wage. Uh, I, I think you know there is there is just massively more evidence that the United States Senate hates you and wishes you ill than there is that any foreign president or prime minister does. Um, and I think there have got to be some people in Washington who are delighted uh, whenever anger is directed uh, across the borders to elsewhere. Um, and of course, the, the scientists who maintain the doomsday clock tell us we are closer than ever before to 
nuclear apocalypse. The risk is greater. And yet the steps being take being taken uh, are, are exactly the reverse. Uh, more nuclear weapons, uh, more nuclear policies, more openness to using nuclear weapons. Uh, and the movement around the world, the many nations that uh, have put in place a treaty to prohibit uh, even the possession of nuclear weapons is up against this escalation of nuclearism led uh, principally by the US government and to be found in the, the budget proposal uh, from President Biden today. Um, and and this, is, this is in line with the behavior of the US government, uh, which is you know, party to fewer basic human rights treaties uh, in the world than almost any other country. Uh, and just this week, uh, the Pentagon declared landmines to be a vital tool that they could not responsibly forego using. Um, so there's, you know, there's, there's this notion now as we're some months into the Biden presidency that, well, we're getting a few things, we're not getting some other things, but you know, that's the way it goes. We didn't elect a different president. We elected this one and he's giving us what he promised. And yet if he was actually giving us what he promised or trying to give us what he promised or making a real effort to get us half of what he promised, we would be significantly better off. The promises are, are, are never you know, as bad as the, the performance. And these are some of the promises uh, from not from the Democratic Party, not from Bernie Sanders, from Joe Biden, candidate for president. Um, so World Beyond War is the organization that I that I work with on anti-war issues the most. Uh, and there are a lot of ways that other organizations can work together with World Beyond War. Um, you can sign the peace pledge that we have on our website at worldbeyondwar.org slash organization. You can consider becoming an affiliate organization, uh, which gets lots of support and resources from us and we work together on things. Um, you can consider joining some of the campaigns where we've got going around divestment, uh, something we did here in Charlottesville, got the city to take public dollars out of weapons. Uh, police demilitarization, something else we did here in Charlottesville, among elsewhere, billboard campaigns, uh, blocking weapons shipments uh, with our bodies, uh, something that World Beyond War chapters are doing, um, or start something new and get us to, to join in. Um, here's, a, here's a picture of some World Beyond War folks blocking uh, trucks, taking tanks to ship off to Saudi Arabia. Uh, for the war on Yemen. This is in this picture is from Canada. Um, the, these, this is advice for, for activism in general, which uh, some of you may not need. You may have been doing activism longer than I have, but uh, it's useful to keep in mind uh, that everything can be educational when we do these divestment campaigns and demilitarizing police campaigns, the, the draft resolutions, all the whereas clauses, the, the op-eds, the interviews, the flyers, everything serves to, to educate people and to organize people for the next action down the road. Um, you may have noticed my, uh, <laughs> my impression that the US Congress is not exactly jumping to the call of, of public opinion, uh, but local governments, are a lot easier and globally and and governments in other countries are a lot easier and so it, it's useful to to work locally and globally not just nationally you'll go nuts if you just work nationally in the most war prone nation um make your own media record everything as we're recording this uh do nothing uh, that does not take seriously how urgent the crises are and do nothing that isn't fun. Um, when we did divestment in Charlottesville, we did divestment from fossil fuels and weapons, not just weapons, uh, because divesting from fossil fuels is, is respectable. Divesting from weapons is treasonous. Uh, so we, we combined the two. Um, and we're working on campaigns to get 
militaries included in climate agreements. You know, there's there's a there's an escape clause for you know for you know re climate reduction reduction in carbon emissions. You know, they they exclude militaries, the, even though they are among the biggest sources uh, and. Uh, so this is the, there are issues like this where you can bring environmental groups, at least the local ones, uh, together with with peace groups um, and, and have a bigger movement together. Um, the the single biggest enemy uh, over at the Pentagon uh, is not in reality Iran or North Korea or Russia or China. It it, it is treating college as, as public education, as other wealthy countries do, giving people uh, a choice uh, because the, you know, people join the US military for all variety of numerous complex reasons, uh, but the most common reason among the most uh, volunteers in the US Army is the lack of another choice, the lack of, uh, of education or career options. Um, and we have to, you know, people, people say you criticize a war, you must hate the troops. Can't you love the troops? Well, I love the troops enough to give them free college as a choice. You know, can you love them that much with me? Uh, you know, is, is my response. Um, so I mentioned divestment is one campaign that we are working on in cities and universities and states and nations around the world. Uh, you know, it's our money, it's public money. We were never asked a uh, teacher who's worked for decades teaching children good things should not have his or her retirement dependent on there being more wars. Uh, it's just, it's just revolting. Um, and we ought to be able to get the money out and, and we are, um, and it's, it's something you can, uh, you can do if you go to this last link on this slide, divestseville.org, you'll see the resolution we used in Charlottesville. You'll, you can watch the videos of us talking to the city council, uh, et cetera. Um, we, we've just started an effort in Richmond uh, to get the city of Richmond to divest from weapons. Um, it's, it's, it's easy. You get a success. You get people involved and you mobilize them for the next thing. Um, same with demilitarizing the police, uh, and this is something where there is some slight chance that something might happen uh, at the national level. Uh, there was supposed to be an executive order from President Biden in his early weeks, and he announced it one morning, and it has yet to show up. There are Congress members demanding it. There is a, a bill in Congress to sort of kind of partially end the giving of war weapons by the federal government to police that may make it into the military bill. Uh, there's another that would end that program entirely. Um, but we want, we want local police to not get weapons of war from anywhere, uh, not just from the US government, uh, and to not do military style training, whoever provides it, uh, US government, the Israeli government, private companies, uh, and you can pass this sort of resolution uh, locally uh, fairly easily. Um, again, I mentioned at the, the beginning, uh, when <laughs> Republicans were controlling Washington, D.C., uh, in their, you know, sexist way, uh, where women are just not up to the task of killing anybody, uh, we didn't have to worry about the, the draft registration being expanded to women. Now, uh, with courts having ruled that it's unconstitutional to impose it only on men, uh, we have a big push by the Democrats in Congress possibly to slip it in almost unnoticed in this coming military bill to double, uh, to double the number of people who have to register for the draft, um, which is, is actually not a tool of peace, but uh, a tool for giving the war makers uh, many more bodies to, to throw into wars. Um, so beyond activism, education, uh, and the two are interlocked and you can do them together, but uh, World Beyond War is doing all kinds of educational activities. And most of them now for the past several months have been online, but we're doing book clubs with authors, webinars, lengthy online courses, uh, etc. Um, and we're 
eager to work with uh, with others on all of these. Um, I, I think uh, just to throw a couple of key points related to anti-war education in here, uh, I think in the United States, uh, it's, it's, I find, especially with young people uh, who haven't really formed opinions on war or peace and don't know that much about it uh, coming out of US schools, that, that you have to point out the unique role of the United States and it has a big impact when you do. Um, it's, the United States is not one country among others. It is the war machine. It is the top wager of war, spender on war, seller of weapons, giver of weapons, provider of training and, and maintenance of weapons, uh, instigator of coups. You know, Almost all the foreign military bases are US foreign military bases. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's, it's worth understanding that the places we think of as war, war prone countries actually manufacture almost no weapons. Uh, and it's a very small number of northern wealthy countries led by this one that manufacture the weapons and export them to the places where they are primarily used. Um, because when you talk about e education and, and opposing war and opposing all war, uh, especially in the United States, almost nobody wants to talk about anything other than World War II. Uh, last year, I think it was last year, I wrote a book called Leaving World War II Behind. Uh, and I just present the table of contents here. I think you know there are a number of arguments why World War II was not a good, just, noble, justifiable war. Uh, but even if there weren't, it's just, it's just bizarre to go 75 years back in the past to find a justification for what we just saw yet again today, what is the majority of, of discretionary spending from the US government. You know, this one little item, war, is bigger than everything else put together. Uh, and yet you have to go back 75 years to, to a completely different world uh, to find an example of it that people want to claim was justified. Um, you know, if, if people would drop that uh, and recognize how far in the past that was uh, and how little it has to do with today, then I wouldn't care if they, if they just adored World War II. Um, there are lots of ways to, to work globally uh, and World Beyond War can help with getting allies and connecting groups uh, across borders because we increasingly have chapters and people uh, around the world. Um, one of the most powerful tools for any local peace group is, uh, is the website. Uh, you know, you get, you'll get back, you know, a thousand fold uh, what you put in uh, to having the best possible website. Um, and I think this is the last slide I've got here. This is what World Beyond War started with seven years ago. And we now have people having signed it in, um, what are we at, uh, 190 countries. Um, and it, it's just these two sentences. Uh, and you can sign it at, uh, at that link, worldbeyondwar.org slash individual. Uh, and when you do, there are a bunch of check boxes that you can check if you want to, to indicate what you want to be involved in and what you don't want to be involved in uh, going forward, working toward peace and the abolition of war. So with that, let me stop sharing screen um, and everybody feel free to unmute if you want to ask a question or Gary, did you want to say anything at this point? No, uh, well, just um, for the latecomers, I put Plowshare Peace Center's address in the chat. We can uh, continue to depend on your contributions, contributions and pledges to keep going. Um, I think I'll reclaim host too, if that's okay, David. Sure, and, I'll make you host. Uh, and I see Michael has his hand raised. Uh, I think I just click here. If there are any latecomers, I can keep an eye on them then. Okay, I'm host now. Um, 
Am I on then? Yeah, sure. Uh, David, I want to uh, thank you uh, for a couple of things. First of all, I, I got as a Christmas present this year your World War II book and read it, and I thought I had <laughs> knew something about World War II, but I learned so much in that book, and I highly mm -hmm. recommend it to anyone else uh, that hasn't uh, read it yet. Uh, uh, that was a brilliant piece of work, and it was highly uh, uh, referenced in the back. Uh, so I, I commend you for all of that effort for putting that together. Also, I subscribe to your emails. Uh, I've made contributions. And uh, the one that came today, which you shared some of that information on the Biden budget, uh, that was a stunner uh, to realize uh, that we have not improved anything at all with Biden uh, in foreign policy. Uh, I really had hoped for more, but Blinken is an old uh, holdover from the Obama years, and it's just going to be a continuation of Russia Gate, and uh, it's just so disappointing. But um, I thank you for your emails. Uh, I learn a lot from them. I value them. And if any of you haven't subscribed, please do that as well. Uh, well, thank you for all of those wonderful comments and for your uh, support and contributions. And I agree 100%. Um, I mean, it's always dangerous to say haven't improved anything at all because there's always you know 18 tiny little things that somebody will point to and no two politicians are actually strictly identical but my god it, it, you're spending this massive mountain of money on all of these wars uh and biden comes somewhere within the range of the of the increase by inflation of the exact amount that trump you know somehow trump got it exactly right uh, you know, and, 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 and all of the war, none of the wars have been ended. None of the weapon sales have been ended. A couple have been, have been stalled, you know, uh, it's just, I, I mean, you can't, you can't say the two presidents are exactly alike because you do have changes on domestic issues. You have radical changes in rhetoric and presentation. Um, but on foreign policy, you know, there's there's such bipartisan harmony, and it's so out of touch with with the public, you know, with the even with the public that identifies with with one of those two parties, you know, if 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 we could just have public referenda on key issues, uh, if we could just have you know Congress members picked with darts out of phone book, you know, we would be just so much better off. Good, Jim. Thank you. Um, I um, learned about David uh, through your book, David, um, Curing American Exceptionalism. And I bought a dozen copies and I've shared them. And after reading that, I knew that we wanted you to participate in our plowshare programming. And I hope we can do it again. But r rather than uh, just my buying books and, and giving them to people. Do you have, have you generated a synoptic uh, DVD or something that, that I could show? Um, I participate <clears throat> with the Virginia Coalition for Human Rights, which brings up the, the terrible inconsistency of the, the Leahy rule, the Leahy law, uh, which Betty McCollum has championed that our foreign aid to Israel, for example, um, is without any <clears throat> Um, accountability and that uh, we're getting took uh, every year um, millions of dollars from Virginia um, and most a very tiny number of Virginians have any clue about where that money goes and how it's spent and so uh, basically they the folks that I speak with in Floyd County um, <clears throat> one stoplight rural Virginia, uh, still think uh, America is the paragon of every moral and religious um, value. And it, the, uh, the bubble that we live in is just 
it's a vacuum. And, and I would just love to show the video at, at our library. I showed 18 documentaries um, in, in 2018 um, from Voices from the Holy Land, which is generated by um, JVP and um, many other sources, uh, which we have resource for in Virginia. Um, and so I just, I would just like to be able to share another subject that gets out, gets at the idea that we aren't who we think we are and we're doing ourselves in, we're poisoning ourselves and we're living a huge lie. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for buying the books. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for, uh, I agree again, a thousand percent with everything that's just been said. Um, I, I actually, found it oddly, sadly, uh, encouraging that within the past day or two, uh, President Biden called mass shootings in the United States an international embarrassment, strictly because the United States for decades has been full of so many international embarrassments. And I can't recall a US politician, much less president, ever mentioning one before. Um, I, I think, you know, I've lived in other countries and people are always asking me, what do Americans think of my country? What do people, what do people around the world think of our country? Uh, every country on earth, I think, is obsessed with what does the rest of the world think of our country? The United States, as far as I can tell, has never given a flying fart what anybody outside of it thinks of anything and so to have i mean it is it's tragic it's horrific it is an it's much worse than an embarrassment but to have a president say that something is an international embarrassment as if it actually matters what people outside of the united states think of something i find that encouraging i can't i can't imagine you know trump having said that um or or any previous president you know in my lifetime at least um I, I also, you know, on the on the same topic of mass shootings, I've, you know, I've been publishing every time there's a mass shooting, uh, an updated study of of just how disproportionately the mass shooters are U.S. veterans uh, have been trained in shooting by the U.S. military, uh, and it's absolutely strictly whited out from the US media. There is not a single US media outlet that will touch that story. Uh, and, and you know, the only excuse I've ever been given is we don't want to create a prejudice against veterans. Well, who the hell does want to create a prejudice against veterans? But there's every story, every story mentions that they're almost all male. There's endless stories about how they're disproportionately have had, you know, mental health issues endless stories about how they've disproportionately have, you know, been abusive and misogynistic and sexual assault record and so forth. Well, nobody's worried at all about prejudice against men or prejudice against mental health victims or prejudice against, you know, people who own guns. I mean, it, but so it's, it's an excuse. Nobody wants to mention that, you know, a mass shooter is over twice as likely to be far more than twice as likely to be uh, to have been trained in shooting by that public expense by the US military. Um, so uh, to answer your question, do I have a DVD about curing exceptionalism or something else? Um, well, I do have YouTubes uh, of things like this event, but on that topic. Um, on my YouTube page and on, I think, the page davidswanson.org slash curing exceptionalism. Um, but also, if you go to World Beyond War and click on resources or worldbeyondwar.org slash resources, there's all kinds of films and videos and PowerPoints and materials for events, uh, endless films and videos. Um, I just watched a new film today, if, if you can call it that, it's only 12 minutes um called something like uh voice uh voicemails uh from the fly zone or something um it, it, it you'll find a review on at the very top of davidswanson.org and worldbeyondwar.org um but it in in vermont you know a year and a half ago they started landing and taking off these f-35s 
from this airport in Burlington in the middle of, you know, houses and schools and shopping centers. Uh, and it's, it's so loud that people can't think their, their insides are vibrating. It's, it, it causes cognitive damage in children. Um, and, and so you've, they, these, these filmmakers, because of the pandemic, they set up this voicemail and they just had people come in and rant about, about the F-35s flying over and we're moving out of Burlington. And I'm reminded of this because one of the comments was to the effect of hoping Senator Leahy would rot in hell. Uh, those are the exact words. Um, because he was one of the chief politicians involved in putting the F-35s into um, Burlington. But, but I agree that, uh, that the Leahy law, uh, you know, if anybody ever enforced it would be a good idea. I think the bill that, that Congresswoman Ilhan Omar had last Congress and supposedly is going to have this Congress called the Stop, Stop Arming Human Rights Abusers Act uh, is a good idea. You don't give deadly war weapons to or sell them to the, the countries that are worst on human rights. Now, it's very weird and twisted because human rights to Western politicians means domestic policy, right? You, you could be the biggest war maker in the world, uh, but if you have decent domestic policies and you're not locking people up without charge and torturing them and so forth, uh, then you know then you are you're outstanding in human rights. Um, but or or you could be you know the most peaceful nation on earth, but be the most horrific at human rights. So I don't know how you give anybody war weapons without abusing human rights. I think bombing me kind of violates my human rights. But to the to as far as it goes you know, stop arming human rights abusers is an idea. Um, I, I wrote a book a couple of years back called 20 Dictators Currently Supported by the U.S. Government. And what I, I looked at the 50 governments that the U.S. government considers the most oppressive. This is bad human rights policies domestically. Uh, and found that the U.S. government arms, trains, and or funds 48 of their militaries, you know, 48 out of 50, 96% of the most oppressive governments on earth. And so I picked out 20 of them that were, you know, that were dictators uh, in the most common sense, a single guy, you know, running the show uh, and wrote about them. Um, sorry, I'm going on and on and on, but I, I wanted, I, I, I also, wanted to mention uh, the Kings Bay plowshares because I keep hearing the word plowshares. And today the last participant in this Kings Bay plowshares action was sentenced uh, and is gonna be uh, doing some more time behind bars. Um, but th there are people uh, out there who are taking these risks uh, in the name of protecting the world from nuclear weapons and other weapons. And we have to try to support them. Um, Whistleblowers as well, uh, Daniel Hale, drone whistleblower, pleading uh, this past week and now uh, facing 10 years uh, when sentencing happens. That's a bunch of leads. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Sherman, did you have uh, a question? Uh, question. Uh, David, you talked so about Russia, and uh, you also talked about uh, the uh, portion of money that the U.S. spends on the military compared to the rest of the world. I was wondering about, uh, I was thinking about the um, kind of the unraveling of the Soviet Union and under Gorbachev in that era. And I think a lot of that is, what we're seeing today is a lot of the after effects of that. But I was wondering how long can the United States continue to spend the amount of money we spend on the military before our economy unravels or other consequences we see in society occur? It, it's a good question. Uh, I do think part of the undoing of the Soviet Union was its overexpenditure on militarism and its uh, under expenditure on, on a lot of other things. Um, but I think a lot of it also was steps toward 
peace and understanding and disarmament uh, taken by the US and Soviet governments. And another big chunk of it was nonviolent activism in Eastern Europe that overthrew governments uh, and split the Soviet Union to pieces. Um, so there were a number of factors. Um, and and I, I, I highly recommend looking at this organization uh, that Sharon Tennyson runs that's called something like Center for Citizen Initiatives that does trips to Russia. I went on one a few years ago. I'm hoping to go on one this year, um, but it's just eye-opening to go and meet with Russian students and scholars and scientists and politicians and artists and, and talk about these issues with them because they, of course, have a very different perspective than we do, including on Gorbachev. Um, and we met with Gorbachev as well and got his perspective on himself. Um, but uh, I, I, I just, I don't claim any expertise at economics. The stuff, uh, you know, bewilders me. Um, you know, I, I feel confident in saying that I want money moved from horrible things to good things. And in pointing out that there is clearly more than enough money for everything I can dream of and more um, because uh, I see how much money the corporations have, how much money the billionaires and multimillionaires have and how much money the weapons dealers are getting. Um, but how many more years this can go on? Uh, I, I suspect it can go on longer than the, the climate and the ecosystems can bear the way they're being treated and quite likely longer than we can continue without nuclear apocalypse. So, you know, pick your poison. Um, I, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that imperial economic collapse uh, is the first horror that's going to hit us. But uh, again, I claim no particular expertise on the question. Uh, yes, uh, go ahead. I, I think that we should bear in mind one thing that the Soviet Union basically broke up without a bloodbath. And those, those so-called evil reds, evil commies, did not instigate a bloodbath in the Russian republics and Eastern Europe during the breakup. Now, contrast this with what the United States has done. Vietnam, I won't even go to the other examples. There's too, too many to mention. By the way, Bill Bloom had that in Rogue State, you know, all these examples. Uh, we can't even, uh, we couldn't even let a small peasant nation like Vietnam uh, leave on its own, make up its own mind about its future without a horrible bloodbath. So uh, I just think that's something to be very, that's something that the Soviets should be commended for. Uh, there weren't uh, bodies everywhere. They weren't bombing parts of their former nation, the nations around them. And uh, it's a big contrast to the way that the United States does business. And I think John Kettler could say something to that. Well. I understand, I've read, I can't tell you exactly where I read it, that the real reason that we went to war with Iraq was that Saddam Hussein made a decision to base his money on the euro instead of the American dollar. And we couldn't have that. And we've been blowing them up for, what, eight years or so now? So you know, uh, there's a lot to what you're saying, uh, George. Uh, I think we could find a lot more uh, examples if we look around the globe. Thank you, John. Thank well, I, I agree with both of you. I think it's more like 20 years off and on that the U.S. has been bombing Iraq. Um, uh, if you go to davidswanson.org and you click at the top where it says war lists, you'll find the lists that Bill Bloom put together and numerous other authors put together of all the wars, all the attempted overthrows, all the successful coups, all the bombings, uh, and it's just endless. There's a professor at American University in Washington named David Vine who came out with a book this past year called The United States of War. 
uh, where he completely debunks this notion that the United States has been at war 89% or whatever. It, the United States has always been at war every single moment that there has been a United States and before uh, it has been at war. Um, and it, 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 is, it is just endless. And, you know, I think, I mean, if, if the Russian government were the only government on earth, I, you know, I would have nothing but criticism for it. I mean, everybody's got a horrible government, including the Russians. But if you're comparing, you know, if you're comparing who's violating international law, who's promoting militarism, who's pushing weapons on dictatorships more than the other guy, I mean, there's, there's no comparison. I mean, Russia has been, Russia, you know, people who get mad at U.S. imperialism are always crowing about how Russia is standing up against U.S. imperialism and is going to be, you know, a force uh, to, to against the unipolar world. And so, yes and no. I mean, Russia asked, wanted to join Europe, wanted to join NATO. Russia was too valuable as an enemy. They wanted to keep Russia as an enemy. Russia has proposed you know, a treaty to ban cyber attacks. Russia is more valuable as somebody to, to blame for cyber attacks. Russia has wanted to ban weapons in space. It's much more valuable to have Russia as a, as a supposed competitor for developing more weapons for space. You know, it, 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 how, how many of you have seen the, uh, the monument to the 9-11 victims that Russia gave the United States? No. <laughs> See, after 9-11, the government of Russia uh, gave this huge monument to the United States of America um, in memory of the, the victims of the 9-11 attacks in New York City. And it was kept out of the news. It was stuck over on the shore of, of New Jersey, like, yeah, beyond the Statue of Liberty and over near Staten Island. And, uh, and I, th I think Putin was there. I mean, the top Russians were there for a ceremony, but it was tucked away in this little corner and hidden and, you know, no TV coverage. So, so people think it's, you know, fake news if you talk about it, right? But it's, it's, there. it's, a, it's a giant teardrop. It's like this giant marble vertical rectangle with this silver teardrop hanging down in the middle of it. Um, it, it I mean, Russia has, has tried. Uh, you know, Russia is not perfect, but they're reducing their military budget. They're the big, evil, horrible threat on the basis of which the U.S. has to increase its military budget for whatever Biden's reasons are, as well as for whatever, what, whatever Trump's reasons were. Uh, yet, Russia spends about 8% of, on its military of just the Pentagon budget. You know, the Pentagon budget sort of stands in in the U.S. media for the whole U.S. military budget, which, you know, with the nukes in the energy department and all the other agencies, it's actually about one and a quarter trillion dollars a year. Just take the 700 some billion, 750 billion or so that, that we talk about. Uh, Russia spends about 8% of that on its military. If you look at it per capita, the U.S. government takes well over $2,000 from every man, woman, and child every year for the military, where Russia takes 100-some dollars from every man, woman, and child in Russia. So, it, it, you know, it, it just doesn't compare. And the notion that there's a threat out, that there's a credible threat out there, that there's a reason for a defense department that would defend from something. It, it, it just, it's just not credible. Do, you know, there, there was a poll many years back where they were Gallup polling, U.S. polling company, respectable corporate organization, polled people in about 65 countries and asked, what is the biggest threat to peace in the world? And the winner in most countries was the U.S. government. But in the United States, the winner was Iran. Iran spends, I think, 1.3%. David? Yeah. Are we locked up? Is who locked up? Uh-oh. I'm sorry, what's the question? 
Well, first I wanted to make a comment that uh, in 2019, the interest on our national debt, $67 billion, was more than Russia's total military expenditures for the year. Um, if I may, and I, I, I'll be quick, but uh, I'd like to read you the letter I emailed to Kane and Warner today. Um, the topic that they asked for is defund the Pentagon. Uh, I'm a Vietnam veteran. I'm very much opposed to President Biden's suggestion that our defense budget be increased. I find our militarism is offensive in every sense of the word. The Pentagon is corrupt, as documented in a Forbes magazine article December 8, 2017, and an article in The Nation on January 7, 2019, the ill-fated attempt at a first ever audit of the Department of Defense had found the DOD's records in quotes, riddled with so many bookkeeping deficiencies, irregularities and errors that a reliable audit was simply impossible. End of quote. Investigators were met with another quote, stonewalling and concealment. One of the most common techniques was unsupported adjustments. One in investigator found that those unexplainable adjustments between 1998 and 2015 by the army alone totaled $21 trillion more than our national debt at that time. In 2015, the army was allocated $122 billion annual budget, but the treasury department made a cash deposit of 794.8 billion to the Army's account, and the Army's records showed accounts payable of 929.3 billion. Senator, our military has not won a significant conflict since World War II, almost 70 years ago, but our defense expenditures are more than the next 11 countries combined. We need to cut the defense budget to half pay down the national debt and fund education, universal health care, infrastructure, and remedies for climate change. Today, the Pentagon employs more than 600,000 defense contractor companies, and the most prized status symbol in America is not a Rolex watch or a Rolls Royce in the driveway. It's a defense contract, a license to coin money. Our country can no longer afford to maintain 800 overseas bases. I hope you'll work to defund the Pentagon. Good. <laughs> It'll be ignored, but I had to say it. Well, the more of them they get and the more phone calls they get and the more they get it publicly in the media, it gets a little bit harder to ignore. So. I do wish you wouldn't use that word though, defense, uh, unless you honestly believe there's something defensive about it. I, I just, I just call it the military, military contracts, military contractors, the U.S. military, um, because if it actually were defensive, if we actually, if that was actually what it was, in the in the ordinary meaning of the word, I'd I'd be in favor of it, of course, and so. David, uh, what are you working on now? Are, are you working on any uh, new books? Uh, I'm not. I, uh, I, I seem to eat up all of my time working for World Beyond War and RootsAction.org and Talk World Radio radio show and events like this one and writing articles and helping other campaigns. Today, a new uh, campaign was launched to try to start a movement at the UN for a treaty to ban armed drones uh, on the model of banning landmines and cluster bombs and nuclear weapons. And so there's a website called bankillerdrones.org. Um, you know, there's, there's just endless things like this coming up. Um, and we're doing these online courses and book clubs. Uh, and 
so forth. Um, I would, I would quit some jobs and just write books if I had the money, but you know, emails pay more than books, uh, sadly. So, um, you know, someday I'll, someday I'll write another book, but, uh, Apart from you, wonderful people, I think most people have yet to read most of my existing books. So, you know, I can share those around. David, yeah. are you are you taking time to ride your bicycle much anymore? <laughs> um, a little bit, yeah. Why do you ask? Good. Well, I remember I was looking at the cover of your ending World War II, and I noticed that you had finished a bicycle ride uh, before that scene where you were at the Iwo Jima Monument. Yeah, you weren't on that ride, were you? No, but I, I was, I ride my bike a lot and I have stand-up bikes and tricycles and the like. Nice. No, so there I, was a, there was a guy, a guy from Raleigh, North Carolina, a World War II veteran uh, who had decided to oppose wars, uh, and he organized this annual bike ride uh, up to Washington. Uh, and I, you know, sometimes, you know, I usually helped with the website and promotion and stuff, but then I, I sometimes managed to do the last 20 miles or something up there in Northern Virginia um, uh, from Reston, where I grew up, down to D.C. And uh, and so my son, who's in on the cover there, the smaller guy on the cover there is my uh, my older son, who was a lot, who was, he, I, he's 15, I think he was maybe, I, I don't know, it was, this was several years ago. Um, anyway, he and I did that trip, but it was, you know, a big group of people on bikes with flags and, and so forth. And we get down to the, to the Iwo Jima Memorial and we're outnumbered by the people with the red, white, and blue uniforms and stripes and, and uh, you know, war, yay war paraphernalia. And so, but, you know, we didn't bother them. They didn't bother us. It wasn't a, you know, there was no protest rally or hostility. It was just, you know, we're here to, we're here to oppose what you all are celebrating. And, you know. It was a good photo. It was a the good- The fellow from North Carolina, um, it has had to stop doing that. He was in his 90s, I believe. He's a, a considerably older man and would ride every year from North Carolina to Washington, D.C., but I, I think he's kind of given up on it now. Yeah, yeah, he stopped. He got a, he got a young guy uh, there in Raleigh to make a nice uh, film about it. Um, what do... I, I can send you all the link if if you can't find it yourselves. What was his name? Sam? Sam, Sam but I don't remember his last name. Sam Winstead or something <clears> like <throat> that. But he got this this young guy to make a pretty lengthy, you know, fi documentary film about his bike rides. Uh, and, you know, and we had some pretty good rallies. One that that year it was at Iwo Jima. Another time it was at the White House. But we sort of like ended the bike ride and had a rally with speakers and. Um, it's a good effort. People should, people should start more things like that. Guys, this has been wonderful, and I'm going to have to part right here in just a minute. I hate to leave you all, but it it has been great, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the PowerPoint because you went too fast uh, yeah. through them and I wanted to read uh, more of the details, but that's fine if you, uh, if we get an opportunity to, uh, to, to get that PowerPoint and look at it more slowly. Um, there were a lot of excellent things on there I want to remember. Uh, so thank you again. Will do. Uh, are there any more questions or comments? Uh, David, I was the person who presented the Leaving World War II behind to Michael as a Christmas present. It was from that. Thank uh, you. The, um, I think the 20 I ordered from you, copies, 10 or 20 books. So Wonderful. I them as much as I can. Thank you a lot, and I do appreciate your effort in that regard.
David, I did have one question. I was doing some reading in preparation for the event tonight. And uh, in your Civil War book, I thought it was very provocative. You were talking about breaking up the United States into more manageable uh, nations, I think. This is from... Well, it's, um, it's uh, Yeah, I don't actually own or control Wikipedia. And I would be I would be grateful till the day I die if any one of you would go to Wiki the Wikipedia page about me and make it resemble me a little bit more. Um, because <laughs> the fact that I made some comment, uh, like a single sentence uh, years and years ago about the pros and cons of, of uh, secession and splitting up the United States, that that according to Wikipedia is you know the bulk of what I work on. It's just very weird. Um, so if you were, if one of you were to go to davidswanson.org slash about and look at my resume according to me, and if you think I've inflated it somehow, you know, fix it, but make Wikipedia, David Swanson, just resemble it a little bit. Yeah. Mention a couple things I actually work on. Uh, that would be great. I'm, I'm actually unfamiliar with my Civil War book. I would ha you would have to inform me of what that is. Do it I was, have a the, Civil uh, War book? The Wikipedia thing was a little strange. It was half about uh, secession, you know, breaking up the United States into more manageable nations, and then about right, half. If you wouldn't open. mind deleting that or adding eight other things so it doesn't dominate, I would be just immensely grateful. You can't edit your own Wikipedia. That's the thing. Uh, so, just I've ask everybody and nobody record. does it. Uh, could you go make it like be a little bit about me and not about this, <laughs> you know, dedicated professional secessionist or whatever? <laughs> well, was, was that an accurate quote though? I mean, I found it very provocative because it's like a sacred thing, you know, the, the union and all that. I mean, <laughs> oh, should the, should the North have let the South secede? Um, I don't think. No, in the piece, it excerpts. It talks about how, you know, if the United States wasn't so big a country, if it was more, you know, smaller nation states, people would be able to, um, like Wisconsin would be able to deal with um, its affairs more easily in California and that's why. Now, this well, is an I old- I don't think like that's controversial. I mean, I, I it's, democracy uh, is, is harder the bigger it is, you know, uh, I, I don't think that's, controversial i think uh you know if 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 the united states were smaller if it were three or four or five countries uh i, I think each of those countries would have a better shot at representative government uh of course you know infinite details and <laughs> because some of them could go horribly wrong but um but i think uh i think yeah one of the problems with efforts at self-government in the United States is it's it's too damn big, you know. I mean, the House of Misrepresentatives is a House of Misrepresentatives because it's literally not possible for somebody to represent three quarters of a million people. Mm. Uh, you, how, how do you represent three quarters of a million people? You, you, you can't. Yeah. I was just a bit taken aback when I read it, but I thought, well, that's an interesting thought, and I never thought about it that way. But see, over over decades, you have a million thoughts, and you make a ten million comments about them, including you know things you didn't think about that you make comments on, and they and they pick one and make it dominate your Wikipedia page. Uh, yeah. So again, if anyone's inclined to to fix that, you know, I'd be. I've never done Wikipedia before. Maybe I can delete it. <laughs> uh, that would be great, or you know, replace it or add something to it. I mean, mo obviously most. It, I don't think it, maybe it mentions one of my books. I have lots of books. Maybe it mentions one of my jobs. I have lots of jobs. I mean, you know, yeah, we should all, we should all fix up each other's Wikipedia pages and create them if, if somebody doesn't have them, you know, because. Yeah, the, the first half of the piece is more representative, I think. Well, thanks for coming and speaking to us, David. Um, it was a very rich discussion. Um, yeah. And if there are no more comments or questions or thoughts, well, I guess we'll adjourn. So thanks so much. Thank you, Gary, and thank you, David. Thank you. Very much. Very Jim much. Is, <laughs> Jim is trying to say I'm something. I'm dying to say something. Your honorarium, you know, I, I deposited your honorarium this afternoon, so. 
Oh, oh, that's not it. That's not it. I'm sorry. <laughs> to David. Uh, David, did you know that we've documented Israeli training of um, Virginia police departments in five different municipalities so far? Um, and I, I want to, to clone this letter uh, to the, it's 100%, I think Durham, North Carolina was the first one to ban Israeli training. Uh, yep. And so the Virginia Coalition for Human Rights, this is one of our big campaigns in Virginia. Uh, and we have a sister organization in Texas. Uh, you know, Alex uh, McDonald, do you know, uh, anyhow, yeah. So th this is a we're very engaged in this uh, and bringing we, we took it to the uh, General Assembly in January and explained what was happening. And they didn't know any hardly nobody knew about. It. And they said, absolutely not. This is not what we're about. So um, I, I'd like to know a lot more about how that happened in Charlottesville. And I think you said there was something online, the uh, the statement that was read. Um, but I would like to publicize that quite a bit. Yeah, well, this was the motivation that got us started in Charlottesville was a friend of mine who's Jewish, who's very concerned about Israel and Israeli wrongdoing and U.S. wrongdoing, who didn't want, you know, Israeli military training U.S. local police departments. Uh, and so even though our resolution never mentioned Israel, uh, right. we, we made sure that we got it passed, including a ban on the Charlottesville police being trained in in military style training by anybody, including the U.S. government, foreign governments, or private companies, um, because that that you know that includes the Israeli government. Um, and, and yeah, if you go to worldbeyondwar.org and go to under campaigns to demilitarize policing, or you go to worldbeyondwar.org/policing, or you email me, um, I, I can give you information on, on what we've done and what people are doing in, in other cities. That was the language we used uh, when we went to the General Assembly. We did 38 uh, Zoom meetings um, with both delegates and senators and wow. it, for information. But anyhow, I'm, I, you're my hero and I'm just well, if, if something to get, if you could get something passed at the state level, that would save a lot of work at the cities. <laughs> well, that's why we're headed for the, and we've been to Washington too. So yes, we want it to be a statewide awareness. And uh, that's why I need to be on board with that. My son is a police officer and uh, it grieves me greatly that he doesn't realize what's going on. I think you mentioned indirectly 1033 and there's been mention of that in the news recently as well. Um, and I'm sure you know more about it than I do, but anyhow, I just wanna say thank you so much. There's, there's one bill to mostly end it and there's another bill to end it entirely and one or both of them might make it into the big military bill that will pass. Uh, Rokana's bill. Uh, well, Hank Johnson has the bill that he's had year after year after year to more or less get rid of most of it. And then Congresswoman uh, Nidia Velasquez has a That's bill right. to abolish the 1033 okay. program. Yeah. And for latecomers, again, our next sponsor program is May 7th at 7 p.m. through Zoom. There'll be a program on conscientious objection. Um, it's for adults and for teens. Um, Bill Galvin and Maria Santelli from the Center on Conscience of War 